Today, we have an amazing guest, Brandon West. Uh, he's making waves with his faith-oriented approach to business leadership. In this conversation, we delve into Brandon's unique philosophy and his ability to navigate challenging situations while adhering to his deeply held values. This episode is an inspiring exploration of authentic faith-inspired leadership that refuses to compromise its principles. Get ready to be challenged, inspired, and equipped for purpose-driven leadership. Let's get started. Well, I'm your host, Clay Vaughn, and I'm best known as the CEO of Good Agency, a full-service marketing agency that helps you market your business and share your story. Now, before we get into this week's episode, I want to give a quick shout out to our show sponsor, Rocket Fuel CRM. If you want access to all the features of email and text message automation, pipeline management, and everything in between, then visit www.rocketfuel.software to learn more. All right, let's dive into this week's episode of Good Business. Well, welcome back to another episode of Good Business, y'all. I am so excited to have a special guest. Uh, Brandon, thank you so much for being here. Brandon, I would love it if you could just um, give us a, a little bit about you. Who are you? Uh, what, what's your background? Why are you here? Yeah, yeah. Clay, such a pleasure, man. So cool meeting you recently and I uh, love what you're doing. Love your heart and just uh, an honor to be here with you and share a little bit. My name is Brandon West. I am the chief purpose officer and founder of an agency called FOS Creative, and we are headquartered out of Gainesville, Florida. We have about 24 people on the team. We literally this Friday uh, celebrate 10 years as a business, so super grateful for that. We say about ourselves that we're a strategy-first digital marketing agency who's passionate about restoring dignity, purpose, and freedom to the lives of women and children impacted by extreme poverty and sex trafficking. And the cool thing is we're, we're funding that really cool mission and purpose that we have by doing excellent strategic consulting, brand strategy, web design development, and digital marketing for small and mid-sized businesses across the US. We do that best with leaders who have a similar mindset on how purpose affects not only their culture, but also affects their message and their position in the marketplace. Wow. Wow. Okay. So many questions. And I know that you and I share a lot of those same values and missions and desires uh, to make an impact on the world for good. I, I think um, there's this question about purpose that most business owners and leaders have, which is how do you determine what your purpose is, what your vision is? Um, I mean, personally, I struggle with uh, kind of shiny objects in business. Um, and, uh, that's why I think I have nine businesses now. Uh, no, no, I sold two last year, seven businesses, shiny objects. That's a problem. Um, but, but I've always tried to maintain this overarching purpose across all of my organizations because obviously purpose and vision tend to come from the leader, but, um, but you've just spent so much time and so much effort in developing this culture of purpose at, um, at your organization. And I'd love it if you could just give us, <laughs> give us your, 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 uh, roadmap. How do you do that? And, and how do you even find your purpose to begin with? That's so good, man. Such a great, great question. I, not to critique you, but I will say that serial entrepreneurship can be an absolute disaster when it comes to purpose-driven leadership inside of any one of those given organizations. It's so difficult. It's so difficult. I appreciate your desire to pursue some form of purpose continuity between them. I just, I, I find, I find that to be extremely difficult. I hate Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, because it challenges me so much. You know, this leader who's like, you got to focus on one thing, one thing. And I'm like, I got 40 things. What are you talking about? One thing, you're nuts. But I think it's, I think it's challenged me to say, maybe the best and most effective leaders are focused on one thing. And if I'm going to choose one thing, like, what should it be? And maybe purpose is the most important choice I could make inside of my leadership. He starts out his book with this Russian proverb that uh, if you chase two rabbits, you'll catch neither. I find that to be so true in my own life as much as I hate to admit it. I think for 
any leader who desires to implement a more purpose-driven culture, they need to understand that the journey to get to the place where I understand that purpose and I focus on it is a long-term commitment. I think that we make small choices to go down a road that we know is really, really long. At my church that I attend in Gainesville, Florida, uh, called Salt Church, it's part of a network of churches called the Salt Network that plants churches at major college universities all around the country. The mission statement of the church is to help people take their next step with Jesus. Like, what's what's your next step? What's your next step? I'm going to help you take that next step. Oh, where are you at? I'm going to help you take your next step. I'm going to help you. Do and just one step after another step to get to being more like Christ. And I think purpose in an organization is the same thing. I, th I think the first time that we go after it, the first time we're willing to ask the question, what's the purpose? What really sits behind? What's our why? What's the thing that's good enough for me to get out of bed? What's the thing that's good enough for me to continue to say yes inside my organization when revenue is struggling, when we just lost another key player, when another client just canceled their contract? What's good enough? to sustain me. And I really think the only uh, answer is purpose. When we go to define that for the first time, it's, it's the hardest step that we take because for so long we've had our head, our head, have, we, have, we have had our head in the sand just saying, I just make websites. I just install air conditioning units. I just cut people's hair. I just sell real estate. Like that's what I do. And, and it's, and, and you just, you've thought your purpose is just excellence in, in your work. And I think what purpose calls us say is there's actually a greater reason, a greater purpose to your work than just doing what you do with excellence. Now, mining for that, <laughs> super tough, super tough. One of my favorite, and there's so many different, I've used about every tool I possibly can, not only to define it, but to redefine it and say, what is it now in this season? How have the last few years changed my purpose? How have it, how's it, how, how, how have my experiences evolved my understanding of what that purpose actually looks like and how it's played out in my work and in my leadership? One of my favorite simple tools, <clears throat> Andy Stanley asked this question, how do, you, how do you define what purpose is? He says it's at the intersection of three things. What breaks your heart? Where is there opportunity? And where do, what do you have skill for? What breaks your heart? Where is there opportunity? And what do you have skills, giftings, callings, passions for? Right in the middle of that is purpose. And I think this is where, again, the leader gets to say, here's my purpose, and then here's my organizational purpose. I do believe that I have <clears throat> a parallel and yet unique calling outside of business that my personal purpose and my organizational purpose, they do definitely align and dovetail one another, but they're different. Uh, our purpose mm -hmm. at FOS, I shared it with you to restore dignity, purpose, and freedom to the lives of women and children impacted by extreme poverty and sex trafficking. My personal purpose outside of work to fund gospel centered ministries through pastoral marketplace leadership to pastor mm -hmm. leaders, in the marketplace. Now, what's so cool is I get to see that purpose fulfilled at FOS and my team gets to come alongside of our organizational purpose and support that with their own unique purposes as well. And it's sort of this purpose ecosystem that's all fueling something so good for each one of us and then for the company as a whole. Mm. I love that. I love that. You know, um, I, I love the example of um, just kind of the purpose being in the middle of all of those different um, perspectives. And when, when I think about just the purpose that we have in our organization, we do have a very similar alignment um, just in the stance of uh, we want to, to, to be there for those who, are, who um, need us. I mean, the, the, the children who are not just caught up in sex trafficking, but the children who um, have been stuck in the foster system, uncared for, uh, who don't have parents, uh, the, the children who don't have food to eat overseas uh, or even locally. I mean, that's a, that's a very real issue these days. So I think there's a lot that, that we have in common there. And I'd love actually your feedback um, as we structure a new initiative um, at Good Agency, which is um, something that's been on my heart. Uh, and frankly, it was put on my heart as I was sitting in that seat listening to you speak in March. And it was... Um, I've got to I've got to be strategic about how I support nonprofits, and uh, so since then we've developed a grant program, which we're launching uh, later this summer, and we're going to be giving away a hundred thousand dollars of 
uh, services to nonprofits who are uh, sharing that same mission, that same purpose. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I guess my question for you as we roll out that program is how do you make sure that uh, an initiative like this doesn't distract you from your purpose? And how do you make sure, and it could be very simple, um, but, but just as we're processing through this, um, this, this new initiative, I'd love to get your feedback on that. And if you've done it before and, and maybe what you would recommend on execution of that. Well, the beauty of what you just shared, Clay, is the clarity that you do have in an organizational purpose. And the beauty of it is because it's so clear and because it's not tied to a service that you offer, right? Or somebody's mission is, uh, you know, our mission is to make great Subway sandwiches, you know, sub sandwiches. Our mission is to make great websites. Oh, okay. Well, if you have seven to slash nine companies that you're running, that can't be your, that can't be a cross organizational purpose. <laughs> yeah. But when you understand, we, at, at folks, like we, we say about ourselves, like we're a business that functions as a ministry, a business mm -hmm. as a ministry, bam. And for us then, like our question really is, well, if you're a ministry, who's your who? Who's your who? Mm -hmm. You ask any nonprofit in the world, who's your who? It won't take them a second to tell you it's the homeless, it's women in pregnancy, mm -hmm. it's crisis. You know, they know exactly who their who is. You ask a business as a ministry, who's your who? They're like, I don't understand the question. <laughs> like there needs to be, a, and when you understand your who, now you've got some cross- cross organizational opportunities to distribute purpose among different sets of people and teams. Mm. And, and you're like, well, it might not fit for one team. Maybe that's just the wrong team. You know, this is where like integrating organizational purpose into a team of people who are like, well, I, I, I just like installing air conditioning units. Great. Here's our, our why. Well, I like or doing organizational. I like, I like installing air conditioning units for this type of business. Well, we don't do those type of businesses. We serve residential only. Well, you're probably not going to be a good fit here, you know. And so, organizational purpose can be a a a team qualifier and actually help to invite mission minded, purpose driven people into your company. Now, the beauty of what what you're talking about here, this new initiative, um, I, I I love it. I think I think for me, one of the things I'm realizing about purpose, as much as I love it, as much as I want to see it integrated so acutely into my company, I think. As, as I drove down to our 10 year anniversary celebration that we had at FOS a week ago, I listened to two podcasts on the way down. And the two words that were on my heart were purpose and idolatry. Mm -hmm. And I actually listened to two podcasts where these women were just sharing their journey to purpose and when purpose can become an idol. And I don't think that purpose is a distraction to organizational clarity. I actually think it invites the, the best form of organizational clarity that you could possibly have. But what I've found in my own life from trying to live a purpose-driven life um, for really the past <clears throat> 20 years of my life, <clears throat> the first book, the first like real Christian book I ever read was The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. I just I just made that connection like six months ago. Like, wow. That, oh, that was really? <laughs> book I ever, wow. Man, purpose has been a part of my journey for so long. Hmm. And I, I think what I'm finding in myself is that while purpose is, is typically never a distraction to organizational clarity, but the, the catalyst for finding it, it is a distraction in my own heart for my identity. And hmm. I can so easily tie myself, my identity, my success, my definite whatever, to this purpose. And when I'm doing it well, I'm a great person and a great leader and I feel really good. And I know, it, and then, and then something starts to change and that hundred thousand dollars I wanted to give away, my company wasn't as profitable. I don't have it. Now I'm a giant failure, you know? And, and so like these different emotions that we struggle with as we try and find purpose, live by it, and then also fight against it as an identity for who mm. I am as a person. So love what you're doing, man. And I would just encourage mm. you to do it well, well and hold it, hold it with open hands. We say at FOS all the time, hold tightly to God, loosely to everything else. Tightly to God, loosely to everything else. I think purpose is included in that as well. Hmm. No, that's good. That's good. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. So um, are you familiar with the EOS model for business? I've talked about it on several episodes here in this. Uh, I am uh, an absolute show. EOS fanboy. Okay. Like. All right. So, <laughs> so you've got your purpose, cause, or passion, then you've got your niche. And I think... 
that has that's honestly been what has preserved me uh for the past oh gosh it's uh eight years ago i think is when i picked up the book traction and um so i I guess i just want to clarify for our audience who may not have read the book traction who may not know how to differentiate between what you do and what you are there for what your purpose is um and i think it's broken up in hey your niche is hey you install ac <laughs> like that's your niche it's we're all about ac uh we're all about websites we're all about selling cars whatever it is but your purpose is always above that and it's designed to cross over organizations so you could get out of the ac business and go and join elon musk on his mission to mars and your purpose remains the same so so i think it is important and you can call it your purpose cause or passion it really doesn't matter what you call it it just has to be above what you do and um i'd love it i'd love to know kind of brandon how how you've integrated eos into your business and and if you've modified it at all um or or um or maybe not adopted it fully um i think everybody does their own version of it in some (laughs) respect yeah, that's so good. I, I, we absolutely love EOS. I found it four years ago. It usually takes me 30 to 60 days to finish a book. I finished traction in five days, five <laughs> days, uh, every single, just, Oh, we need this. Oh, we need this. We had so much strategic clarity before we, before we implemented EOS and it absolutely skyrocketed after mm-hmm. EOS. So we hand traction out to almost every client that we work with highly recommend it. I do think that if you cut it up and you try and implement parts of it though, you will destroy the the beauty of the system and its ability to holistically manage your company. And so for us, we, we, we're what, what EOS calls EOS pure. Um, EOS pure is like you try and implement the system to the T. Good. Um, now I do think is particularly inside of the vision traction organizer, there's some definitions there and you're actually getting at my least favorite ones that, that whole niche versus purpose, like where's mission? What about vision? Like there's some, there's some nuanced vocab there, you mm-hmm. know, like guarantee your promise, things like that. Like, um, that, that I think could create some organizational, uh, unclarity, destroy clarity in an organization. If you're not clear on defining those things, but I really like how you said it, right? Like that niche is that idea of what you do. The purpose is why you do it. Simon Sinek would call that maybe your, your just cause. Mm-hmm. I remember working with an organization once who very much so had their head in the sand. We rented out an Italian restaurant here in town, the back of this Italian restaurant. And I met with, I had a couple of people from my team and their whole executive team just sitting there. And I'm trying to help them under discover what's that purpose? What's that? Why? What's that organizational? Uh, why that sits behind everything that you do? They've got the what with clarity. And I'm trying to ask them these questions about their why. And, you know, why do you, what's your why? Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. We just make, we make steel products. Like it's nothing sexy. And I was like, well, why do you come to work? What's your why? And this one woman was like, I come to work. Cause it's only a five minute walk from my house. And I was just like, oh okay, shoot, shoot, this is going to be harder than, harder than I thought. And then, I'm, and then I'm asking, okay, what about this purpose? Why? And then it's just like silent. And, and I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work. And one guy raises his hand and he says, our purpose is to fund the lifestyle of our executive team. Mm. And I just went, <laughs> I'm like, oh. I'm like, I am about to lose my job here. They're going to fire us. This was horrible. <laughs> and I turned and oh I said, no, 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 no. I, I, I get that what you do is complex. You've got some bitterness there that you need to figure <laughs> out, but I, I get what they do. It's complex. It's, it's very technical, but like when you're sitting at home at Christmas, and your mom says, what do you do again? Because I can't remember. It's really complex. How do you answer? And after this really awkward, long silence, one guy raises his hand and said, when I'm driving down the highway, I, I saw this sign recently and it had the, the large Hadron Collider in a picture. And I pointed to, to that and I said, mom, that's, that's what we do. And one guy was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The other day I was back in the back and I was like working with one of the manufacturers who was like welding some piece together. And I turned to him and I said, dude, I want you to know this piece that you're welding right now is going to be used in cancer research. This may actually be the tool one day that helps us find the cure for cancer. And then somebody else was like, yeah, yeah, no, I was telling this. And the room just lit up and I just sat back and I said, job complete, right? Like they, Mm -hmm. they finally got their purpose. It wasn't about making some stupid steel container. Yeah. It was about funding projects 
that we're going to change the world and change people's lives and pr promote healing and flourishing in humanity. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful moment where that what, that niche becomes so much more acutely connected to their why. And this was five years ago. I see that leader in Publix now and, and just uh, at a grocery store, and he's still leading now from a purpose-driven seat inside of a third-generation company, wow. uh, which is a very That's hard incredible. thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so pivoting a little bit, um, you've talked a lot about your, um, your, your company culture and how purpose affects that. Um, we, as just kind of a society, have gone through kind of this, I don't know, grinder where everybody just changed jobs all at once and um, everyone went remote. And now we're going through a, a new mix up where there's mass layoffs and uh, people are trying to make decisions about, all right, well, can I even afford to, to take this job over this job? So it's, it's just a tough culture uh, to try to operate a business in. And I'm sure you felt it. Um, I haven't met with a single business owner who hasn't felt it in some way or another. What I'd love to do is just to, just to spend a little bit of time talking about your specific company culture. And I think on your website, you say that you, you want to have a company that no one wants to leave. Well, I think we all would agree with that, uh, that, that you want a company that, that your clients find absolutely essential and that makes the world a better place. How does that look? Or what does that look like? How does that happen? And do you feel like you've gotten there? Mm. Yeah. Uh, do I feel like I've gotten there? No, but the beauty, okay. of setting, <laughs> the, the beauty of setting your eyes on something is it changes the way that you think. You know, this whole idea of like, well, was it Michael? I always mess up this quote, like Michael Jordan, like you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Like, That's if, you, about if, right. you, if you don't set your eyes on something, like, will you shoot for it? I, I find it so interesting when we set that, that vision statement that I shared about dignity, purpose and freedom, women and children. When we set that vision statement, we created a 10 year target inside of our EOS uh, vision traction framework that we would open 10 care centers in the next 10 years within one. And I remember when I said it to my team, like, here's what we're going to do. They, they like laughed at me. They were like, <laughs> okay, visionary. Well, we'll write it down on a piece of paper and we'll see what happens. You know, one year into it, we saw, we, we, we launched North central Florida's first ever sex trafficking safe house. Like within one year. And it was only because I, we, we wrote it down. We set it in front of us and said, this is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to focus on. And I think that's, that's the beauty of setting our eyes on some goal that seems so far beyond us. Mm -hmm. We, we decided to up that goal um, because we partnered with Compassion International and found new ways of being able to fulfill that mission. Now our, our goal is to have 30 care centers in the mm -hmm. next nine years launched around the world. And by the end of this year, we'll have seven in place, one in North Central Florida, three in the Dominican Republic, two in Mexico, one in Colombia. And these, wow. these centers are gonna serve uh, almost a thousand women and children in extreme poverty and sex trafficking. And uh, all because we set our eyes on, on, on that one goal. Um, I think in this ecosystem of it's super hard to hire people and how do I get this and how do I stand out and what's like culture and purpose can be one of those things that people say like, I want that. I want that. I, that's what I want in for. I mean, we, we have a guy right now in our hiring pipeline. He works at IBM. If he takes a position with us, he will take a 50% pay cut in what he's wow. making in, in this role. And I'm like warning him, like, are you ready for that? You ready to live on that? Like there's a, a hard family choice that he has to make there. But he's done with corporate America. He's done with being a cog in the wheel. He's done with business for business sake. He wants to work for an organization that cares about purpose and people and culture. For us, that our, our mission, you said it almost to the T, our, the, our stated mission, what I've been sharing with you is our vision. Our stated mission is to be a place that our team never wants to leave. Clients can't do without. The world is better for, and in so doing, exemplify the love of Jesus. The thing that really defines a great mission is, does it become an arbiter for your company? Do you make decisions based off of your values, 
based off of your mission in pursuit of your vision. That's how you can tell really how integrated this is into a company. For us, every single employee benefit that we offer, every single initiative that we roll out, we're running the six month wellness program right now focused on relational wellness, spiritual wellness, um, uh, physical wellness, intellectual wellness. All of those things are designed to help us fulfill our mission and live by mm -hmm. our values. The way that we implement business as a ministry and have a, a, a whole team here, that we call it our care team. It's a whole team dedicated to inspiring a culture of love, care, ministry, and compassion inside of our team at FOS. It's voluntary. It's got, I think, four members in it right now. And their, their goal isn't to do all the love, care, compassion of folks, but to inspire the whole team to do that. I think little random acts of kindness. I think, you know, you brought up remote work. Yeah, it's as, as an agency who has chosen to, to run a hybrid model, some, some in office, some out of office, but also have a few remote workers, we've chosen the hardest thing possible, mm -hmm. <laughs> where not only is it some in, some out, it's also some remote, some not. We bring, we bring all of our people in once a quarter for our quarterly vision meetings. We bring everybody in for our annual vision meeting. We bring everybody in for our anniversary that we call the Fosversary, our Christmas parties. I think there is, I, for, for me, for the way I lead, there has to be some face-to-face, all-in-all interaction. But outside of that, unfortunately, the key word is just intentionality. I hate that word mm -hmm. because it's not an answer. It's only a commitment. It's, it's not an answer. It's just a commitment. You're making a commitment. I will go and lead intentionally. I, I think like we're, we're doing this right now. We're doing this over like virtually. I, where are you, where are you yeah. at, Clay? What state are you in? I'm, I'm in Texas, Austin. Yeah. So we're Austin. hundreds of miles away from one another right now doing this, talking about purpose, talking about mission. Why can't you do that over Zoom? Why can't you do that over Slack? Why can't you do that over Google Meets? Uh, why can't you? You can. It just requires a lot of repetition and intentionality. And I think repetition in the hands of a leader who's not actually driven by purpose, but is trying to leverage purpose as a tool for culture or for hiring, it comes off so insensitive, so inauthentic, and it actually breeds cynicism and distrust in an organization. But purpose and repetition in the hands of a great, truly purpose-driven leader is actually the tool to driving organizational awareness and engagement. I love to just remind leaders, like, what if, what if your repetition wasn't the sign of you being a bad leader? I have to tell them a million times. We say this about parenting. I've had to tell my child a million times. What if that wasn't a sign of you being a bad parent, but a good one? And what if it wasn't a sign of you being a bad leader, but a great one? And so in repetition, intentionality in the hands of a truly authentic leader, it's the power for, for implementation. Beautiful, beautiful. So a um, couple final questions as we kind of come to the end of our time. I'm sad that I just looked up at the timer. I'm like, oh no, we're running out. Uh, so, so obviously your faith plays a critical role in um, your purpose and even just the culture that you set in your company. Um, I personally have gotten a whole lot of negative feedback about how integrated I make my faith into our organization. I mean, we pray before meetings. We, we spend time uh, talking about our mission to honor God. Literally, that's in writing. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I get a lot of flack for that. Um, but but I, I guess just in your uh, situation, you've been doing this for about a decade now, which is, um, I'd say that's uh, enough of a track record to to have some understanding on how this works, but how do you recommend blending those two where you don't cross over a line um, uh, into um, the, the practices of frankly doing things against like hiring guidelines and expectations and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, how do you balance that? Yeah. Well, you know, it's it, it's it's somewhat of a misnomer to say that FOS has been doing this for 10 years. We've been in operations for 10 years, but I believe that we've been a business as a ministry for only really the past four to five years. Okay. Well, I remember when I started this company 10 years ago and my wife and I asked this one very simple question. Are we going to put the word Jesus on the website anywhere? It's going to be on the about page, mission page, in the footer. It's going to have a little Jesus fish. Like I, I just, and I just remember we just said, no, no. Hmm. We're just going to do great work. We're going to 
do our work with excellence and people are going to come flocking to us being like, this logo is so amazing. Please give me a reason for the hope that is inside of you. And I, I just clearly am not holy enough. Like that doesn't happen. People don't just come running up to me after we build a website and they're just like, sir, what must I do to be saved? Um, that, just hasn't, that just hasn't happened yet. I think for us, we've been realizing more and more that for a truly like God-driven Jesus focus, gospel and kingdom minded leader and company, there shouldn't be any daylight. There shouldn't be any, 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 there shouldn't be any sun setting between one day and another. It should, it should always be sunny. It should always be bright. It should always be who I am there. There's no discontinuity there. I, I am the same. I, what I find so interesting is that people love to say, well, oh, this is a Christian company. This is not like a Christian USB drive. I don't even know why I have this still. Like, how would that, <laughs> that USB this drive is... cannot be saved. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a Christian pair of headphones. This is not a Christian microphone. Like, it's that's just those things don't exist. And so, I, I think if you're trying to run a Christian business, you're going to find yourself sorely disappointed because there's never been such a thing. There's only at best companies that are run by dedicated, faithful Christian leaders. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think for me, yes, it's about operating out of our values. It's about operating. We do have some core beliefs. We had a really difficult situation that arose a year and a half ago where a client who we've, we've, we've been working with for many, many years, we've become more purpose-driven in our relationship with them. They've become more purpose-driven in a very different direction than us. And they came and they said, hey, we really wanna grow in, in demonstrating our purpose. And so we want you as, as our creative agency to develop these sort of materials for us, this type of content, and begin to post mm -hmm. about these things on our social media channel. And they were things that contradicted our closely held mm -hmm. Christian beliefs at those. And so we had to come to them and say, look, we love you. We want to work with you, but um, I can't produce that content. Let us do all of this 85%. You handle this 10 to 15% in-house. But because mm -hmm. we said that, the relationship got toxic very quickly. Yeah. Um, some really serious m meetings where we were just being yelled at and, um, you know, FOS is a platform for spreading hatred in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I used to refer you wildly. I'll never tell another company about you ever again. And, and, and so we had to work with ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom, same people who defended the cake baker out in Colorado, who's yep. right now defending another agency who's at the Supreme Court for a similar issue. And we developed a, a nine page statement of faith for FOS. And it basically said, we will work with any business leader in the world, regardless of your beliefs. We will work with any business in the world, regardless of your core services, as long as it's good for humanity. But as, as an agency that has closely held Christian beliefs, we cannot support every message in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was going to go awesome. I thought she was going to be like, great. That's what I wanted to hear. And it just absolutely blew up in her face mm -hmm. and it, it got so bad. We had to let that client go say, Hey, look, we'd love to continue to serve you, but because of the way we're being treated, we can't, it was a very difficult situation. I had anxiety for the next three months, waking up every morning, waiting for a lawsuit to be sitting in my inbox. Oh, I believe you. Yeah. And we had to just get to this point where we said, look, our only options are to either change who we are, shut our mouths on the things we find important and just stick your head back in the sand and do business or be faithful and move on. And the only one that seemed to, to satisfy my heart, my conscience and be faithful to Christ and the kingdom of God was the third option. And so in that case, I had to say, I'll be faithful. I'll be silent on this particular issue. I won't respond to the threats from coming from this person online, videos being posted about us. And God's blessed that it brought oh, yeah. gospel conversations into our company where people were wanting to know, why did you just do this? How could you, you know, and, and now I'm getting to sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and go, well, you know, this is why, what do you think? You know, and discipleship gospel, uh, hmm. God's faithful in the middle of those pursuits where a faithful leader will raise their hand and say, you've given me a platform. What other good ROI could I get from this company except eternal ROI in the kingdom mm -hmm. of God? And I'll give myself fully to it, Jesus, no matter what it costs. Mm. Man, that's a good word. Well, first, I, I commend you for doing that. Um, you did the right thing. Not that, I, not that you needed to hear it from me, but um, it's very rare that I get to come across someone who... Um, who puts their money where their mouth is. And so I, I respect you immensely for doing that. 
Um, and uh, I think that that actually answers quite a few of my questions here about um, how do we how do we see this played out in real life? And I mean, we live in a very difficult time. And I know everybody in all time has said that, uh, but I'm just going to say that for right now, we live in a difficult time where um, there's a lot of hurting people and uh, a lot of hurting people that hurt people. And because of that, um, it, it, you can choose to walk on eggshells or you can choose to be bold and brave. Um, and uh, what is it in Hebrews um, uh, either 1139 or 1239, it talks about how uh, we should never shrink back as believers. Um, and uh, I think you've, you've truly embodied that by not shrinking back. And that's when, that's when the author of Hebrews, whoever we want to say the author of Hebrews was, um, uh, was, was just uh, commending believers who were going through trials and tribulations. And right now, we should not shrink back from our faith. We should not shrink back from incorporating our firmly held uh, beliefs uh, into our daily life. We cannot be fake um, we cannot um, hide behind uh, silence, and uh, I think your your um, uh, example of how you've done that is is exactly what uh, everyone listening to this episode needs to know. Is like if you want to honor uh, God with your business, if you want to lead a values driven business, you can't shake uh, shake up or change your values just based off of who wants to pay you money. And um, so, anyway. Well, Brandon, thank you so much. Um, I know that uh, we're over time, but I, I do have one last question, which is very, very small. Um, and uh, this is more tied to me selfishly. What are you reading right now? And um, who, whoever is listening to this podcast wanting to um, uh, understand how to lead a pur purpose-driven organization, uh, what would you recommend that they read? Um, to make sure that uh, they've got kind of a handbook uh, per se. Any ideas? Yeah. yeah, I'm in the middle of a couple books right now, which isn't okay. typical. I like to focus on <clears throat> a few. Uh, in my devotional times right now, I'm going through a, an Ortland, Dave Ortland book called mm -hmm. In the Lord I Take Refuge, which is just uh, a Psalms. It's just the Psalms, um, the mm -hmm. Psalm. And then like maybe a couple of paragraphs uh, in the next Psalm, it's a couple of paragraphs and it's very gospel centered. It's been a fantastic devotional. Um, been so good just going through the Psalm. So in the Lord, I take refuge by Ortland. Uh, I'm going through A.W. Tozier's The Knowledge of the Holy right now, which is just helping me think about God. Just helping me think about God. Classic. Um, I'm reading The Secret Tradecraft of Elite Advisors by David C. Baker right now on how okay. to run a consulting uh, company. What's so interesting is as an agency, we are a consultancy to some degree. Um, learning how to do that better, super cool book. I'm reading The Toyota Way to Lean Leadership right now. If you've ever studied lean leadership, very difficult to try and figure out how that more manufacturing focused leadership style can be applied to an agency, but it's it's really uh, challenging me. And because it's Relational Wellness Month at FOS, we're doing this marriage um, challenge together uh, for all the married couples on the team. And so we're going through a book called The Love Dare, which was based on oh, Fireproof like yeah. uh, 10 years ago or whatever, Kirk Cameron movie. And uh, it's been really, really good. Just challenging us to love our, our spouses uh, better mm -hmm. in Christ's name. I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, Brandon, how can people contact you? How can people engage with you? Yeah. Yeah. Would love to um, hear from some of you guys. If there's anything that we could do to serve or provide um, encouragement or challenge on regards of purpose or messaging and marketing, foscreative.com, P-H-O-S, foscreative.com, the FOS Life and Leadership podcast as well. And then on all of our socials, Instagram is a fun place to kind of see culture in action for FOS and uh, our handle there is FOS Creative as well. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Brandon, thank you so much for carving 40 minutes out of your busy day and uh, sharing that with our audience and with me. I feel very blessed and uh, encouraged um, by this time that we've had together. And uh, to all of our listeners, guys, thank you so much for tuning in this week. We'll see you guys next time on Good Business.
All right. If you like this podcast, please subscribe now and share with friends, family, and other business leaders. You can learn more about each guest and the resources we discuss at podcast.clayvon.com. And if you're a business leader looking to market your business and share your story, check out Good Agency at www.goodagency.com. We'll see you next week on Good Business.